Kelly Needham was getting her kids ready to leave the house. She got a little impatient and raised her voice. We got in the car, and I buckled everybody up, had a moment to just breathe while everybody was strapped in. And I was going to turn around and apologize to my daughter. Before I could get the words out, this comes from behind. Mommy, are you going to apologize to me now? (laughs) Sweet girl. And you know what came out of me that moment? Wrath. (laughs) I felt anger. But, Kelly says, God is not like us. And He does not respond like us to some of the same circumstances. This is Revive Our Hearts for Monday, July 1st. I'm Dana Gresh with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Choosing Forgiveness. So how do you respond when someone hurts you or treats you badly? Our first impulse might be to lash out in anger, but today we're going to hear a better way, a compassionate response. Throughout this month on Revive Our Hearts, we're going to be focusing on the topic of compassion. And that's something that can be especially difficult when we've been wronged. Stay tuned because later in the program, I'm going to tell you about a time I needed to forgive someone who hurt me. And I'll tell you which passage God used to help me do that. Kelly Needham is a wife and a mom. She's an author and she's a good friend. She and her husband, Jimmy, live in Texas with their five children. And she was part of a gathering we hosted here at Revive Our Hearts that we call the Sisters in Ministry Summit. These were women who all have writing or speaking ministries of their own. And it was such a sweet thing to get together and encourage one another, to look into God's word together and to learn from each other. Today, I wanna share with you what we heard from Kelly Needham. Let's listen. We're gonna talk about the shocking compassion of God. And I'm really excited to talk with you about this. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. But I first wanna tell you about a really difficult experience in my life. My senior year in high school, I got a phone call from one of my dearest friends who lived in my neighborhood. We had grown up playing violin together in orchestra. We went to each other's houses, we had sleepovers. And she called me to let me know that her mom had just been killed in a very tragic car accident. You never forget where you are in those moments. What was also happening at that time is that I was in a really unhealthy relationship with a guy in high school. He was a Christian, but it had just gone south. And I knew I needed to end it, but I was really afraid because of just his tendencies. And I remember talking to him that night because we were still together and telling him about my friend. And I was just grieving and sad. And his response to me was so jarring and and self-centered that I think that was the cold water to wake me up and say, I can't wait any longer to end this. So that same night I told him, we cannot be together. It's not right. It's not healthy. This is not a good relationship. Well, I knew it was going to be bad to end things with him because of his jealous tendencies and controlling tendencies, but it was far worse than I imagined. He went on to describe ways that he wanted to then kill himself um, to try and keep me on the phone, to keep me from getting out of his life. Well, the next day, of course, my friend group is reeling from the news of my friend's mom who's just passed. And so we decide after school, we're going to go to her house and we just, we bought a cake and brought five forks, because that's what you do when you're grieving and you're a woman. And we were gonna sit with her and eat cake and just be there with her. And my ex at that time is calling me over and over and over and over and over again, hundreds of times, and I'm not answering. And so I turned my phone off to be present with her at her house. And I will never forget this moment of realizing this is how crazy this person is. We're sitting on the floor, My friend's mom's violin is in the other room full of glass shards still. And we're sitting there just listening to her. And her dad, the grieving widow, walks in and says, someone's on the phone for Kelly? My ex had called, found her number, called her house to get a hold of me. And of course, to spare my friend and them from that drama, I stood out on the front porch with him for probably two to three hours just to keep him from interrupting what was a really sacred moment. There are many other moments I could tell you about the hardship of 
that followed those next four years. We had parents get involved, the school got involved, we almost got a restraining order. Eventually, that ended, and I grieved and I processed with people in the healthiest of ways that I knew. But then we went to the same college. And so things just kept coming up. And what I remember feeling about my relationship with him, and especially how I was treated afterwards, is I just felt just taken advantage of, exploited in times of weakness, used. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. It's a horrible feeling to be taken advantage of and feel like your weaknesses are being pitted against you to get something from you. Well, I'm generally pretty like, I just want to avoid conflict and go with the flow. But something happened, I think, in just the harm of that situation that was birthing a response in me, especially when I started to interact with him again in college. And I had a moment, I don't know why I was on the phone with him. He found some way to get a hold of me. And something in me just snapped. And I've never felt such anger in my whole life as in that moment. And I've never talked to anybody the way that I talked to him. And I let him have it. I used the strongest language I could to explain how he had robbed me of precious moments with my friend, how he had taken away from me things that I could never get back. And I just spewed wrath (laughs) into the phone. And he ended that, I don't know how long I talked, 20 minutes. And after that, his response was, well, did you ever consider how I felt through all of that? I hung up the phone and I threw it with all the energy I had at my bed in my dorm room so it wouldn't break. (laughs) And I wept out of anger, just sheer anger. I've never felt anything like it. I've never experienced anything like that since. I look back on that and feel like it is my phone call of wrath, (laughs) the wrath of Kelly. When we're taken advantage of, when we are the ones who are being used, exploited. That's our response. It's wrath. It's anger. It's, this is not right that you would treat me this way. And what I think is so shocking about this chapter is we're going to see that God is not like us. And he does not respond like us to some of the same circumstances. So turn with me to Hosea chapter 11. And we're going to look at God's response to being mistreated. The book of Hosea is written by the prophet Hosea, and it's written to the northern kingdom of Israel. And just to get a little context for them, some of the the kings that came from that kingdom are kings like Jeroboam, who built golden calves to keep the people from going to the temple to worship God. People like Ahab and Jezebel, who killed all the prophets. This is the northern kingdom of Israel, who Hosea is writing to. This is God's word to that people. This is a people full of idolatry and too many sins to list. And so in Hosea chapter 11, we see God speaking to his people. And this is what he says. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but to Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. I want to stop there. Do you hear the language of God toward his people? It's so tender. It's motherly. I taught them to walk. I carried them. I eased their yoke. I bent down and fed them. That's what we do as moms. We bend down and we feed our kids. And yet, in all of that, the more that they were called, the more they went away. They sacrificed to idols. They refused to return to this God who loved them. They are 
bent on turning away from him. Now, I want to put a little bit of, of extra feel to what that means, that they're bent on turning away from him, and just read you some other parts of the book Hosea that have happened before this, things that God has said to his people already. That in Hosea 1-2, he says, the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. The Lord is comparing himself to a lover who has been cheated on. He says in Hosea 4-7, the more they increased, the more they prospered, the more they sinned against me. In Hosea 4, 10 through 12, it says, they have forsaken the Lord to cherish whoredom, wine, and new wine, which take away the understanding. My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. That they have the living God, and they'd rather seek a piece of wood for wisdom. In Hosea 7, 11, Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. They could call out to the Lord, but they'd rather call out to former slave masters. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. In verses 13 through 15, destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds for grain and wine. They gash themselves they rebel against me. They don't cry to him for him. They want things. Give me grain and wine. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. In Hosea 8, 11 through 12, because Ephraim has multiplied altars for sinning, they have become to him altars for sinning. Were I to write for him my laws by the ten thousands, they would be regarded as a strange thing. They don't even recognize God or his word anymore. Wouldn't recognize it if they saw it in front of them. Hosea 8, 2 through 5. To me they cry, my God, we, Israel, know you. Israel has spurned the good. The enemy shall pursue him. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but I knew it not. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. You hear them? We, we know you, God. We're good but they go and build idols. They make kings in their own way. This is what it means when God says they're bent on turning away from me. Their default is to go astray. And what I don't want to do is read this passage myself or have any of us go, those people are the worst. Good thing I'm not like them. Because the truth is, this is our story. This is who we are. It's in more graphic language than we would talk about our own sin and our own bentwardness away from God. But this is us too. We are the enemies of God. That's who we were before Christ, right? Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death, the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? Yes, we are saved by his life, but let us not forget we were first his enemies. James 4.4 4, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And our hearts want to befriend the world. That's in me. And that is to be an enemy of God. We are also his enemies. Our hearts are also prone to turning from him. We've sang that. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Right? Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned everyone to his own way. We've all made idols and sacrificed to them. Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. That envy that lurks in us when we see someone else wearing what we want with the house that we want, with the kids that we want, with the husband that we want, with the followers that we want and the blog that we want and the opportunities that we want, that green jealousy in us, the word tells us is idolatry. We have begun to prefer something else above the living God. And it is no different than the golden calves that Israel made in their day. We forget that it was God who healed us. We take God for granted. We forget the things he did for us. The mountains he's moved in our past, we're forgetful. 
just like the people of Israel. And when I'm treated that way, like an enemy, I'm forgotten about, I'm mistreated and taken advantage of, what bubbled up out of my heart was wrath. I'm angry. And what is so shocking is that we're going to see in verse 8, God's response to this is utterly different. Look with me at verse 8. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Hallelujah. (laughs) This is what makes God different than us. Holy. Holy means set apart and other. He is other than us. He is separate than us. And part of that is that he, when he is mistreated by us, says, I have burning anger, but I will not come in wrath. This language in 8 and 9 isn't even choice language. Like, well, I could let them go, but I'm going to choose to show compassion on them. It is emotional. How can I give you up? It's, there's, compassion is a very, I'm moved to do something for somebody else. It is inward. It starts inside. A lot of the Hebrew uses of the word compassion, I want to ask my husband this. He had said he had talked to a Hebrew scholar, and he said the best way I could put language to that Hebrew word for compassion is warm womb. Warm womb, that there's a motherly, just emotive longing and and moving towards somebody out of compassion. That God looks at the people who have mistreated him and has compassion on them. My compassion grows warm and tender. It's shocking. It's shocking. Never in my life could I have that response to someone who has treated me that way. And God says, I know. I'm not like you. I'm God. I'm not man. I'm not like you. I don't come in my wrath. Now, how can that be, right? How can God extend such kindness? Because there is burning anger. There is wrath for sin. We know that, right? That Ephesians 2, 3 calls us children of wrath before we have been saved, that the wrath of God abides on those of us who are in sin. How can God do this? There's one reason. It's Jesus. Jesus is the only reason that God can extend this compassion In Isaiah 53, said of Jesus, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep, yes, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That last verse, verse 10, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. I love the translation that comes from the NASB that says the Lord was pleased to crush him. That if you look at the the word usage in the Hebrew of that word, it is across the board used as pleasure and delight in other parts of our Bible. That it was the pleasure and delight of God to crush his son. I have no concept of that. And that's, again, we're man. We're not like him. 
He was pleased to crush his son because his compassion for us is love for us. It is, it's not a choice. It's, uh, there's a, an internal compassion, kindness, love from God that is something that is so hard to fathom. I can't imagine it. Jesus is the provision for this promise in verse 8 and 9. For I am God and not man, I will not come in wrath. He is the provision that makes it possible for God to say this to us. But he's not just the provision for this promise. He is actually the manifestation of it. That when God came to us, I will not come in wrath. When he came to us, he didn't come in wrath. Galatians 4, 4 through 5 says, But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. 1 Timothy 1, 15 says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Jesus came not to first give the wrath of God, but to come and receive the wrath of God so that we didn't have to. He came to bear our wrath for us so that he could come in the compassion of God to welcome us into his fellowship and friendship, though we have been his enemies and bent on turning away from him. He had compassion on us, and it is shocking. He is so different than us. That is so good. That is such a good thing. He is so other and distinct and unique in this way. In chapter 7 of of the book of Micah, it says it this way, in verses 18 through 20. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have shown to our fathers from the days of old. Who is a God like him? That though we are bent on turning away from him and even once he has saved us, our hearts pull us toward friendship with the world and idolatry and covetousness, that he says he will pardon our iniquity and He will not come in wrath to us, and he welcomes us. If this were me being treated this way, I know how I would act because that happened to me, and wrath is what came out. And that Paul understands this when he writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 7, for one will scarcely die for a righteous man, right? Though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. And what's implicit there is a bad person, someone who's mistreated you, and we wouldn't even think about dying for that person. We might consider it, maybe, for someone really good. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We've been delivered from his wrath, not because we deserved it, but because of his great shocking compassion for his enemies, that he would go on our behalf to bear that for us. What is this supposed to do for us? What should this do in our hearts when we read this? I know for me, my first response is just praise. God, how could could you do this for me? To just thank and praise him for who he is. It is so good to remember who we are, who we're not, and to remember that he's not like us and who he is and how he's different than us and to praise him for that and to thank him that he's not like us, to not even try to be like him and to go, thank you, Lord, that you're not like me. You are other and holy and perfect and pure in your compassion and to meditate on that truth and to think on it and to spend time on it. So much of of my Bible study for so long was, tell me how to be better, me, (laughs) Tell me how to be a better me. But these passages have helped me go, I just want to forget about me for a second and go, who is God? How amazing is he? How different is he from me? To spend time on that. I think these passages call us to that. To think on his otherness 
and how amazingly good it is for us and how glorious it makes him. But secondly, I think this is what helps motivate us to show compassion to others. I don't know who you struggle to be nice to, to be kind to, to feel like a tender feeling toward. For a lot of us moms, that could be our kids on any given day because we feel this a little bit in parenthood. I bend down and feed you every day and you don't give me a thank you? Have you ever felt that? We don't say it all the time. It sure rises up. I remember my daughter one day had just, it felt like from the moment she picked her sweet little head up from her bed until we were making it in the car to run some errands, probably only 11 a.m., it was constant complaints. I need, I need this. Why haven't you done this? Why isn't this working? And I was actually that morning really working hard to be patient. I remember that, Lord, give me patience. And I was, uh, you know, doing really good for a while. And I had this moment right before we left where I just kind of blew up a little bit and raised my voice. And guys, I just need a second. I don't remember what I said. But again, I was working really hard, like, Lord, help me grow in this area. And so we got in the car and I buckled everybody up, had a moment to just breathe while everybody was strapped in. And I was gonna turn around and apologize to my daughter. Before I could get the words out, this comes from behind. Mommy, are you gonna apologize to me now? <laughs> Sweet girl. And you know what came out of me that moment? Wrath. <laughs> I felt anger. No, I'm not gonna apologize to you. That's what, what was bubbling out of my heart. I don't have it. I don't have it, but the Lord does. And meditating on his compassion for me, soaking it in, thinking on it, meditating it, then I can remember that moment, Lord, I'm just like my daughter. Lord, are you gonna apologize to me for not giving me what I wanted when I wanted it? That's in my heart. And the Lord is patient and kind with me. And he pours out compassion on me. And as I think on that, that becomes so beautiful to me that then in that moment, I have strength to go, Lord, make me like you. I'd be, I wanna be more like you than like man, like humanity, and I can't do it. Would you help me? For some of us who've been deeply hurt by others, there is, I think, real anger and wrath for sin, that it is right to be angry at sin. I think that some of my anger toward that guy in high school was righteous. I had been sinned against, and there is right anger for sin. But wrath is not mine to distribute. The sins of that man against me were primarily against God. And it is from God that wrath will be given for that sin, either on the cross or on him. It is not my place to distribute wrath. And I had a friend lovingly, after that episode happened, when I processed with her, told me, your healing, Kelly, will not come from him owning those things. And it won't come from you punishing him for his wrongs. You have to leave that in the hands of God. And then you have to look to God for restoration. I had to walk away. I wanted punishment to be doled out. But we can trust that God will do that. We can also thank him that he doesn't want to do that, that he has sent Christ to bear it for us if we will be so humble to receive it. I don't know what need you have for the compassion of God and what it needs to move in you, but it's when we look to his compassion and his great mercy and his great empathy for people who are not deserving of it that will actually motivate an overflow of that to those in our own lives. Let's pray together. Thank you so much, God, for your shocking compassion. For people who are bent on turning away from you, that though we deserve your wrath and we deserve punishment, God, you are not like us. Thank you. God, you are not like man. You are holy and other, and you do not come in wrath. Thank you so much, God, for sending Christ on our behalf to bear the weight and burden and punishment of our sin and instead welcome us with clothes of righteousness to be brought in with compassion and tenderness and loving kindness. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for who you are. 
And we ask you that you would move in our hearts as we worship you for that, to be able to walk in your ways, modeling your compassion for others in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. I have a date next to verse nine in my Bible. I won't tell you what date it is, but it's a number of years ago. And when I look at that date, I can remember a set of circumstances with some people who had hurt me deeply and anger was welling up in my heart. I felt I had been misunderstood. Things had been said that had been hurtful, painful, and my heart was kind of reeling from that. And then I came to this passage, which wrecked me as God's word is intended to do. And I read this verse at the end of verse eight in the beginning of verse nine, my compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. And I wrote next to that date in my Bible, give me your heart toward those who have wronged and hurt me. So take just a moment in your heart to first just thank the Lord for his steadfast love that endures forever, for his amazing compassion towards you, that he has not executed his burning anger towards you. Instead, he put it all on Jesus. Just a moment to say, thank you, Lord, that I'm the recipient of your compassion, that Jesus took the burning anger I deserved. And then when you say, as you think about that person or those people who have sinned against you and perhaps deserve burning wrath for their wrongdoing, would you say, Lord, thank you that you bore the consequences of their sin as well. And say, Lord, I, I don't wanna execute my burning anger. It's not mine to distribute, as Kelly's reminded us. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Don't return evil for evil, but rather turn good for evil. Overcome evil with good. That's what God did for us. He overcame our evil by pouring out the righteousness of Christ upon us. How amazing is that? Ah, that's Nancy demoss Walgamuth helping all of us respond to a message brought by Kelly Needham. God's compassion truly is shocking when we think about it, when we think about what we deserve and what He gives us instead. Compassion is our theme this month at Revive Our Hearts. To go with that theme, we want to let you know about a booklet by Aaron Davis called Uncommon Compassion. The subtitle is exactly what Kelly Needham was talking about today. It's Revealing the Heart of God. You see, the more we understand God's compassion to us, the more we can show compassion to others. So ask for a copy of Uncommon Compassion when you make a donation of any amount this month. To do that, just head over to reviveourhearts.com or call us at 1-800-569-5959. Tomorrow, we'll hear from Erica Van Heitzma. She'll help us consider what she calls the humiliation of compassion. I hope you'll join us to hear more tomorrow for Revive Our Hearts. This program is a listener-supported production of Revive Our Hearts in Niles, Michigan, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.